Justice Committee's 17th meeting of 2017. We have no apologies. Agenda nine, item number one, decision on taking an item in private. The committee is invited, invited to take item five in private, which is the consideration of witnesses for our scrutiny of domestic abuse Scotland Bill. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item number two is consideration of the affirmative instrument on the Apologies Scotland Act 2016 exempted um, proceedings regulations 2017 draft. And um, before I begin, uh, I'd like to declare a voluntary interest as the formal member in charge of the Apologies Bill, uh, the Apologies Scotland Act 2016. And yes. On that subject, could I just say and put on the record how helpful it was that you shared your personal correspondence and response with the Minister? I thought that for those of us who, in quite a technical area, had perhaps not got, that was very helpful. Should you wish to do it again, I encourage you and other members to do similar. <laughs> I shall note what you say. <laughs> right. Um, I welcome... Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, along with her officials, Eleanor Awe, Civil Law um, Policy Manager, and Katrina Marshall, Directorate of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. And can I remind members that officials are permitted to give evidence under this item, but not participate in the formal debate on the instrument um, at Agenda um, three, this item is a chance for members to put to the minister and officials any point seeking clarification on the instrument before it's formally disposed of. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk. A number of submissions have also been received in relation to the instrument and have been circulated. And I invite the minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you and good morning, uh, Convener. These regulations do two things in relation to the Apologies Scotland Act. They make a small amendment to the existing exception for inquiries and they add an exception for the uh, essentially uh, fitness to practice proceedings of 10 professional regulators. Currently, the Act accepts inquiries which Scottish ministers cause or jointly cause to be held under the Inquiries Act 2005 but does not exempt inquiries held in Scotland solely at the instance of UK ministers. While these are likely to be rare, making this change will provide consistency. The second exception is in relation to the proceedings of 10 professional regulators, which are the regulator of the social service workforce and the regulator of teachers in Scotland, as well as eight health regulators. The need for making this exception has been clearly set out by the regulators themselves, in their briefing papers to the committee. It is clear that the Apologies Act could have negative unintended consequences for their fitness to practice proceedings. In particular, it would impact on their ability to establish facts and make risk assessments. In terms of their procedures, uh, an apology can provide an important piece of the full evidential picture, not just the terms of the apology and any undertaking that was made, but also the circumstances of the case. An apology can be used as evidence of the level of insight into wrongdoing a professional had, which in turn can be an important part of an assessment of the risk they may pose to the public in future. The need for this exception was raised by the General Medical Council and the Nursing and Midwifery Council as early as during Stage 1 of the Apology Scotland Bill, and their concerns were recognised by the Justice Committee in their Stage 1 report. Continued work revealed that these concerns extended beyond the health regulators. The Scottish Social Services Council and the General Teaching Council for Scotland have made clear they share the concerns about the impact of the Act on their proceedings. I am keen for the Apology Scotland Act 2016 to have as much benefit as possible and I am grateful for the input that the convener has had into the process to maintain the focus on that aim. These draft regulations therefore only accept the proceedings of professional regulatory bodies who have a shared rationale for the need for their proceedings to be accepted, ultimately with a view to preserving their ability to protect the public. Thank you, convener. Thank the, the Minister for that response. Can I open uh, maybe just with one question? 
in stage three proceedings, then it was made quite clear by the then uh, Minister for um, Community Safety and Legal Affairs that the exemption would apply only to health provisionals. And this was because it was seen that the provisions of the Apology Act and the provisions of duty of candour, which the government was going to um, introduce, could not coexist because under um, the provisions of the duty of candour, an apology must be made, and if it is made, it would be used in legal proceedings. And that runs entirely counter to the provisions in the Apology Act uh, under Section 1. So would the Minister confirm that was the case? Uh, what I can say is that during the passage of the Apologies Bill, uh, certain issues uh, arose. Uh, one of them was the uh, position of the, at that time, 2015 Health uh, Scotland Bill, which became the Health Scotland Act of 2016, which introduced the uh, uh, organisational duty of candour. And that um, was a discussion that was ongoing during the passage of the bill. But at the same time, during the passage of the Apologies Bill, it was recognised that in addition, there would need to be an exception in order to take account the concerns of uh, regulators and health regulators at that time uh, of the uh, way in which the bill could cut across their professional standards and therefore regulatory processes. Uh, and therefore, the fact that there was going to be a, a duty of candour head of exception uh, was not deemed sufficient. And that is why discussions were ongoing uh, about there being, in addition to that, an exception for these uh, professional practice regulatory proceedings. So I hope that deals with the first point. With regard to the second point, uh, convener, um, what I would say is that during the course of the work that was undertaken by officials to scope out how the uh, exception would therefore be drafted, what would be the appropriate approach, uh, discussions were held with uh, health regulators and those discussions extended beyond the uh, GMC, the General Medical Council and the National uh, uh, Midwifery Council to other health regulators. And in the context of that work, uh, I think uh, as far as the Scottish Social Services Council is concerned, uh, it was one of the health regulators who flagged up this issue to them. And with regard to the General Teaching Council for Scotland, uh, that uh, could have been through that similar route or indeed as a result of direct discussions that officials had in good faith exercising due diligence as they are required uh, to do. So that is how that came about. And where we are today is because in essence, uh, these regulatory bodies, the 10 regulatory bodies have made it quite clear that they share uh, the concern that the application of the Act would impact negatively by way of unintended consequences on their fitness to practice uh, processes and regulatory uh, proceedings in that uh, regard. And therefore, they share the concern that this would limit their ability to protect the public. Isn't it the case if you followed that, then every regulatory body could put forward the same argument? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think so, because uh, in fact there are a number of regulatory bodies we have uh, managed to uh, uh, establish from that they would not be uh, seeking any uh, particular uh, uh, exception, and these include the Law Society of Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, the Institute of Faculty and Institute of Actuaries, Chartered Bankers, Professional Standards Board, Civil Aviation Authority are the ones that we're aware of at this stage. So it is uh, as a result of the fact that the uh, nature of the, uh, in essence, fitness to practice proceedings of these eight health regulators and the Social Services Council and the General Teaching Council for Scotland uh, uh, are such that they share the same concern based on the same rationale that the Act, the Apologies Act 2016 would cut across their regulatory procedures in a negative way, and they assume it was unintended that it would be negative, but nonetheless in a negative way, which would in turn impact negatively on their ability to protect uh, the public and for the public to have confidence in the way in which these professional uh, bodies regulate their uh, professional members. 
If we set aside the um, eight health professionals, because we're all accepted that they will be exempted, from my point of view, from the duty of candour, and if we concentrate on the GTC and the SSW, who you say have the same um, concerns that the other ones um, do, but the other eight are going to be exempted because of duty of candour. That's been accepted um, uh, at stage three by the minister. Could uh, the previous minister, could the minister explain in what way it could negatively impact, the act could negatively impact on GTC and SS? Okay. Um, just to, to clarify the point, the other eight are not being accepted on the basis of the duty of candour, as I tried to explain during the passage of the Apologies Bill and now Act of 2016. It became clear quite early on that other legislation, specifically the uh, Health Act or Health Bill 2015, as it then was now, the Health Act 2016, uh, was going to require a separate head of exception. That was agreed. That was made clear. But notwithstanding that discussion and that agreement, it was also recognised that there in turn would have to be yet an additional head of exception to cover the uh, regulatory proceedings of these of the health regulators at that time, as that had been, uh, those had been the bodies anticipated. So that wasn't to do with the duty of candour exception. Indeed, it is quite clear that notwithstanding that there was going to be a duty of candour exception in the Apologies Act 2016, there had, in addition, uh, the, there was recognised that there had, in addition, uh, uh, the requirement to have as an ex additional head of exception these regulatory processes. So it's not correct to say that this was as a result of the duty of candour. With regard, if I... Yes, yeah. certainly. Sorry, I was just going to, to, yeah. to try to deal with the second point. Uh, I think the uh, committee Before you has... leave that point, oh, though, sure. Minister, um, but they were all health professionals. That's what they all have in common, the eight. And that was accepted, that GMC had come in, um, I think the British Medical Council, and there may be others. That was always accepted, but they always came under the banner of health professionals. They did at, at that time come under the banner of health professionals, but it wasn't to do with the duty of candour exception that had already been discussed. Uh, and as I was trying to explain to the committee, um, in our due diligence uh, 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 work that was required in order to come up with a, a, a statutory instrument, it became quite clear that as for the Social Services Council for Scotland and for the General Teaching Council for Scotland, they shared exactly the same concerns about how the Act would cut across their uh, professional regulatory processes such that they would not be able to fulfil their duty of protection of the public in the way that they felt that they should. And that is why we have arrived at the SSI being drafted in the way that it has been to include specifically these uh, 10 regulatory uh, bodies. And I would refer the committee to the detailed submissions of both the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the uh, Social Services Council for Scotland, uh, which have been submitted to the committee. I'm sure members have had a chance to read those, and they set out quite clearly why they share the same concerns as the health regulatory bodies. Uh, 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 so I hope that that is... Would the Minister explain then why she thinks the GTC and the SSSW would be negatively affected? by the provisions of the apology. Well, they make it quite clear that in terms of their processes, the processes that they have laid down, which are ultimately designed to ensure that the public is protected, that the bill, the, the Act, rather, the Apologies Act 2016, would cut across their processes just in, this, in a similar way t in which it cuts across and has been accepted, it seems, by the convener, the eight uh, reg health regulatory Can bodies. Can I stop you there? It was never accepted um, that the, the health professionals and others uh, would, would be adversely affected by the Apologies Bill, but it was accepted that the duty of candour, which expressly says that an apology must be admissible once it's given in civil proceedings, would affect it. So it was on that basis that I agreed. So if you could just explain why the GTC and the SSSW would be adversely affected by the provision of the bill. An example, perhaps, would help. 
Um, I, I certainly will, uh, Convener, uh, uh, in one second. And just to, to go back to the issue of the duty of candour, just to make it quite clear that this exception for regulatory bodies is not to do with the duty of candour. There is an exception for duty of candour already agreed in the bill. It was recognised at the time of the passage of the Apologies Bill, now Act, that there would have to, in addition, be a set, completely separate head of exception, which was to encompass these professionally regulatory processes. And in that regard, I, I, I could quote... Um, during the stage one debate, um, Alison McInnes, who said, on regulation of health professionals, the Nursing and Midwifery Council and the GMC both argue that the bill would have serious unintended consequences. The warnings that we have heard from those bodies must be heeded. The regulation of our health professionals is an important safeguard, and we should do nothing that impacts on the regulator's ability to bring a fitness to practice case. Can and I stop the ministers there? The health professionals are not at dispute today. What is, is the GTC and the SSSW. Yes, but it's the could same you, rationale. It's well, exactly could you explain what the rationale is for the GTC and the SSSW? They have set that forth quite clearly in the, in the position the papers to, to, the, to the, the committee. committee. Uh, and so if we could just take the uh, Social Services Council, for example, they have explained uh, why uh, the exception is required. Uh, and they go on to explain the nature of their process and how each part of the process interlinks one to the other. And they also say uh, that if uh, the Act were to cut across their, uh, their processes, there could be uh, significant implications on the coherence of the processes that they have laid down, where in a certain part of the process, the Act would apply and the apology would not be uh, part of their evidence, uh, which they look at, to look at insight, to look at risk assessment and so forth. Uh, but it could be part of subsequent parts of their processes, so there would be a, a complete incoherence and inconsistency in their, their ability to carry out their processes in a coherent manner. Uh, they uh, say, for example, an apology by a worker does not necessarily mean that the worker is admitting liability. However, the terms of the apology and the circumstances around which it is made may be relevant to the factual consideration. We highlight the importance of a worker making an apology when something goes wrong. This is an important part of a worker showing that they have learned from what went wrong and helps to show that the worker has insight. We believe that a panel should remove social services workers who persistently fail to show a lack of insight into the seriousness of their misconduct. It may substantially prejudice the worker if there were practical difficulties in a panel being able to take a worker's apology into account. So that, for one, is the position of the social, uh, Scottish Social Services uh, Council. Can I perhaps refer the Minister to the definition of the apology and perhaps once I've done that she could give me an example of where this would um, adversely affect anyone in the GTC or the SSSW. The definition of apology means under section 3 any statement made by on behalf of a person which indicates that, and this is quite precise, the person is sorry about or regrets an act um, omission or outcome and includes any part of the statement which contains an undertaking um, to look at the circumstance in giving rise to the act or omission or outcome with a view to preventing an occurrence. Now as the Minister will appreciate for survivors of sexual abuse who have been abused in an institutional situation very often by um, people who would come under the SSW or in a boarding school or school environment, then the acknowledgement that this has taken place is huge in itself. The expression of regret goes a long way to helping the recovery, but the undertaking to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else by looking at the circumstances is huge. In the limitations bill, We've already said people will not, a lot of the survivors will not go down this route and do not want to go down the route of formal trial and compensation. But the apology could be just what they need. Can she explain a circumstance where this would, the bill's provisions as laid out in section three, would be to the detriment? of um, anyone because they weren't exempted under the GTC and SSSW. Okay, um, just to, to clarify, of course, and I sought to do that in my most recent letter to, to the member, um, the, the, the accepted uh, 
proceedings as set forth in this SSI do not in any way cut across the uh, opportunity for institutions, be they schools or whatever, to issue an apology. This does not cut across that in the slightest. And I think it's important, given the very important subject matter that the member has just raised, that we put that uh, on the record. Quick point then. When we're talking about an institution, bricks and mortars do not give an apology. A person gives an apology. And that person may well be giving that apology as a third person on behalf of someone else, saying, I acknowledge this happened. I'm sorry it's happened. I will um, do everything I can to look into the circumstances to make sure it doesn't happen again. Th that is, That's a person. That, is, that it, person could be a member of yes, the GTC I mean, it, and the SSW, and the exemption would stop them. In fact, I would say almost certainly stop them no, giving I, that I, apology. I because I think there's it been could, two th if things. If you just let me finish, Sorry, Minister, because it could adversely affect them. And that's what the whole apology legislation is about. It's, um, it's putting into a bill what is already law in civil proceedings. What, what I would say to, to the member is um, that I think it's important that we understand the, 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 the two key different points being made here. One is that if an institution or a third party on behalf of that institution responds uh, in terms of an apology on behalf of that institution, that is entirely different from an individual who is apologising for action that they themselves have taken. Okay, That is an entirely different set of circumstances. The first set of circumstances, the, this SSI does not acro cut across that in the slightest, and I would like to reiterate that, for, reiterate that for the record. The second set of circumstances where an individual uh, themselves who are apologising directly for actions that they have taken themselves at some point in the past, uh, I, I guess in those circumstances, two uh, issues would uh, arise. One, in terms of the, uh, any, if they were within one of these regulatory, the domain of one of these regulatory bodies, a fitness to practice proceeding uh, would most likely arise if they're still on the register of that professional uh, body. Of course, the, when looking at a set of circumstances, the regulatory body will also take into account the gravity of what the relevant incident is. Uh, and, and a second point to make here, of course, is that the Apologies Act 2016 has no impact on the criminal law. And therefore, if an individual were apologising for actions that they themselves had taken, uh, then uh, I think what we would, we would see and what I think we would all expect to see is that the criminal uh, uh, authorities would thereafter embark on an investigation and I think we would all expect to see that. So I think those are two uh, different circumstances uh, and therefore it is correct to say that this SSI does not uh, cut across the, the conclusions of the interaction process, which I know that the member followed carefully, which was that for uh, institutions like, for example, schools and local authorities, that they should have a facility to issue an apology without the worry of civil uh, proceedings. And that is absolutely respected by this SSI. On the other point that the, the member raised, um, in terms of the definition of apology, of course, uh, uh, in section one, uh, subsection B of the Apologies Act 2016, uh, the, one of the uh, elements is that the, uh, an apology made uh, cannot be used in any other way to the prejudice of the person by or on behalf of whom the apology was made. Now, the point that these regulators, including the Scottish Social Services Council and the General Teaching Council for Scotland, are making is that there could conceivably circumstances, notwithstanding their general approach that apologies are to be welcomed and so forth, but there could, in terms of their proceedings, be certain circumstances where an apology would, taking into account all the other evidence before it, nonetheless be used, if you like, to the detriment of the person concerned and they need to have that facility to retain the coherence of their regulatory uh, 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 proceedings which are in the end of the day designed to ensure that the public is protected. I'm going to let other members get in. All I'll say is statements of fact are not protected. So in these circumstances it would be criminal and the Apology Act and the apology would be admissible. 
we're looking specifically at the definition, which is merely an acknowledgement, an expression of regret, and an undertaking to look in to see if anything could be done. And the point the minister doesn't take is, if it's someone apologising on behalf of, there is the potential, as the um, FBGA submission points out, of a duty of care being raised um, for that professional and that adversely affecting them potentially. And if that's the case, then they're not going to apologise and the closure that the survivors seek is not going to be open to them. Other members will have questions. Rona. Good morning, uh, Minister. Um, as someone who's not been involved in the earlier stages of this bill, it, it, it's quite a, lot, quite a lot to take in. I wonder if you could just clarify from what I'm understanding of it for the GTC and the SSSW. Um, not to be exempt, exempted would sort of impinge on their professional judgment on whether someone is fit to practice or fit to teach and hamper the framework that they've been working to to ensure best practice and, and actually to protect the public. Is that, is that really what the, the, the nub of what, why they want to be accepted is? In essence, the member is absolutely right. Uh, in essence, it boils down to the, the, the need to protect the coherence of these regulatory processes in order that uh, they can uh, fulfil their mission, which is to protect the public in the end of the day. Uh, and whilst the genesis, it's correct to say that the reference of Mr Wheelhouse in the Stage 3 debate uh, where he stated quite clearly that the government would come back with an SSI in due course uh, to deal with the cases that he was aware of at that point, which concerned the coherence of these professional regulatory processes. Uh, uh, and uh, at that time, it is fair to say, as the, the convener has mentioned, that the reference was specifically to, to health regulators at that time, the GMC and the National Midwifery Council. However, in subsequent discussions that officials were required to carry out further to due diligence and the exercise of good governance, it became quite clear that these two additional non-health regulatory bodies uh, shared exactly the same concerns in terms of the nature of their proceedings and the role that an apology could or could not play in those proceedings and therefore they were concerned that if they were not also accepted that would impinge on their ability to ensure that they can, if you like, police their profession and ensure in the end of the day that the public is protected. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was here when this bill went through, but I confess to have not paid close attention to it, and, I, and it's clearly quite a technical area. What I've tried to do in my own mind is to come up with an example um, that, that touches on precisely uh, the part of the bill, uh, the act to which the minister referred. In other words, 1B, can it be used, if any other, uh, way to the prejudice of the person? And I'm thinking of the example I have in my mind, which would not be caught with the criminal law, is a teacher who, having taken a strong dislike to a particular pupil in the school, uh, in a situation where that pupil is making choices about what courses to cover, the teacher chooses to exclude them from a course that they might want. Because the course, perhaps, is a course that has equipment, it's only got space for 30 people, 35 people have applied, one of the five is excluded simply because the teacher dislikes a pupil. Now, that would be professionally quite improper, it would seem to me, and a matter that the GTC uh, should properly get involved in. Would it be the case, and I'm asking for an opinion as distinct from a legal opinion, because of course the courts would decide a legal opinion, as to whether if an apology were made in terms of 1B, that would carry with it the risk that the GTC could not then deal with that matter raised by that apology in uh, professional standards. Is that an example of the sort of difficulties that we get into, or are there better ones? I think, I think the member captures the kind of difficulties that could be faced and the, the point is that the apology can't be used to the detriment of the, the person and it has been clearly explained by the various regulators in their submissions to the committee that actually in some circumstances uh, it, it could be uh, and it cannot be ruled out that an apology in the context of, of when the apology was made or not made, in the context of the other evidence before that regulatory body in the instant case before it, because each case will turn on its own facts and circumstances, it can't be ruled out that the fact that the apology, if it, is to be, uh, if it could be used for the detriment of somebody, is 
ab initio to be excluded under the 2016 Act, it can't be ruled out that that would cut across at the proceedings of the, in this case, the General Teaching Council for Scotland, uh, and to the detriment of the coherence of their proceedings and to the detriment uh, of uh, the, the public uh, in terms of which the proceedings are, are there to, uh, to ensure that we all have confidence in, in this case, the, the teaching profession. Just on and move to the teacher's relationship with the pupil having been one of an inappropriate sexual relationship. That being a matter for the criminal law, I'm assuming that to be the case, an apology made under this Act would not inhibit the GTC from taking action or indeed the courts from taking action. So it is, it is whether it's inhibited or not inhibited entirely relates to what is being apologised for, and in particular in cases of sexual offending. It would not create an inhibition uh, in relating to the individual who is involved in the inappropriate behaviour. Well, it's correct to say that the Apologies Act 2016 has no impact on the criminal law of Scotland and any uh, allegation uh, in, in terms of somebody within one of these professions or anywhere uh, involving uh, inappropriate sexual uh, conduct uh, would uh, obviously meet up with the uh, criminal law authorities uh, who would mount an investigation uh, and it is very difficult to see in what circumstances and I think we can all recall past cases where uh, in such circumstances for example within the teaching profession uh, that uh, the, the teacher's ability to teach is suspended pending uh, further investigation so uh, I think it is important to bear in mind that the Act does not cut across the criminal law but notwithstanding that these regulatory bodies through their submissions to uh, the committee have made it quite clear why they are concerned uh, that the coherence of their uh, uh, ability to ensure that those uh, for whom they are responsible are meeting the professional standards required and that the regulatory body has the appropriate authority to tackle circumstances which obviously uh, we know are, are you know, very much the exception rather than the rule in amongst all these professions where everybody does their very best. But nonetheless, the regulatory authority must retain uh, the, the ability to uh, investigate in the way that is appropriate for, uh, for their profession. If I could perhaps take Stuart Stevenson's example. Teacher dislikes a pupil, excludes him from a course. Well, surely the, there's a complaint raised. That's what we're assuming. I mean, it's not going to be an apology out of the, the blue. And the facts will be looked at. And they'll either be proven or not. And if an apology is given to the effect that, look, I'm sorry um, that um, you, you feel there's been an omission here, you've been excluded from the case. Um, I regret that. Uh, but we will look into the circumstances. Really, and, and each, so, each case will depend on its fact and, and circumstance, but it is important to remember what the definition of apology is in terms of the 2016 Act, which includes this element of uh, no detriment to the individual. And that is where this cuts across potentially with the, the 10 regulators, because there could be circumstances conceivably where an apology is uh, a part of the proceedings. Can we keep this example, Minister? Yeah, where is, is part that of the to example? the detriment if someone, a teacher or someone on behalf of the teacher gives that apology. Where's that a detriment to anyone? Isn't that only to the good of the person seeking an explanation? One would need to look at all the facts and circumstances of each case. What I'm trying to explain is that uh, the, given the definition of apology includes this element of no detriment, then what these regulators are saying is that as a result, this cuts across their processes, and that as a result, if they are not accepted from the Act, their ability to protect the public will be diminished, and that is what they're saying. I refer you again to the definition and what it says in every single section case. one that B. Will always be the same. <coughs> section three. Section one B is the detriment issue. Uh, anyone Thank else you. want to come in? John Finney, Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Minister, you, you touched on this a bit earlier. It's about the consultation. Um, I understand you, the issue was discussed with the UK government. Was there a view expressed by them? UK government on, on the, the issue of the Inquiries Act? Yeah, on, uh, on, on what we're discussing at the moment, the specific the regulatory body. The I think the discussion with the UK government was about the inquiry exception. Right. And what view was expressed? Please. Well, on the inquiries exception, it, it, it seems that as a result of an oversight, the, that 
the way that the inquiries exception had been uh, framed was to include within the exception inquiries, 2005 Act inquiries initiated by the Scottish Government, initiated jointly by the Scottish Government with the UK Government or conceivably one of the devolved administrations, but had, it had not included within the exception inquiries under the 2005 Act uh, in, instigated solely at the behest of the UK Government. Now, whilst in Scotland that would be rare and we can't easily imagine the circumstances, nonetheless, uh, it was felt that in order to ensure consistency that that should be included within the exception and that has uh, not received any opposition, as you can imagine, from the UK uh, Government in that regard. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the, the other regulators who were contacted and you, you laid out a list there. Did, did any of them say why they weren't concerned about this? Yes. So the Law Society, for instance, said that apologies do not feature in their proceedings. It's not a, a useful bit of evidence in their proceedings. Uh, and any, did any suggest that they would adapt their processes to incorporate this? Because one might imagine that you know, a, a law's passed and uh, bodies would respond to that by looking at the procedures and what implications they might have. I think that's a good question, and I think it's certainly something that we'd be happy to, to, uh, to write to the, the bodies wh whom we know uh, are not concerned about not being part of the exception. So that's those I listed were the Institute of Chartered Accountants, of Scotland Faculty of Advocates, Law Society of Scotland Institute, Faculty and Institute of Actuaries, Chartered Bankers and Professional Standards Boards, and Civil Aviation Authority, and we'd authority. be very happy uh, as a follow-up to, to write to those bodies to ask uh, what account uh, they intend to take of the Apologies Act 2016, assuming uh, it does indeed uh, come into force. Okay, uh, um, Minister, you also, I think, a couple of times has used the term shared rationale between the, the General Teaching Council and the Scottish Social Services Council. And indeed, that manifests itself in an astonishing similarity in the submissions we have from them, um, in some sections verbatim uh, the same. Is there a perception that this is people getting together to try and avoid the application of something which is, was commended by this uh, parliament? Um, I, I hope not. I, I don't believe that that's the case. Um, the, the genesis of, of where they started, and often keeping track of legislation is not something that all bodies are, are equally good at. Uh, and uh, it, the genesis was, uh, during the passage of the Apologies Bill, that the issue came to the fore because the GMC and NMC were very much on the case. They had discussions, uh, as did we, with other health regulators who found that their proceedings, it, it stems rather from the proceedings being essentially similar rather than some attempt to gang up to defeat the, the bill, but just because the proceedings are essentially similar, and this was recognised uh, at the time of Stage 1 in the Stage 1 report. And the reason that we have the extra two, if you like, here today, the non-health regulators, is simply because they also have put to the government that they are in essentially the same position, have shared concerns, and do uh, 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 have the concern as with the others, that if they are not accepted from the Apologies Act 2016, it cuts across the coherence of their regulatory fitness to practice processes, which in turn would mean that they feel that the ability, their ability to protect the public would be diminished. Well, okay. Uh, can I ask, would you envisage any other organisations coming forward? Where this to pass? Um, I, I, at this stage, uh, one can't rule that out, but to, to date, nobody else has, uh, and they have had the opportunity to do so, so we can only make the reasonable conclusion at this stage that, that we don't expect any great clamouring. Uh, obviously, if that were to happen, we would have to look at the facts and circumstances to see if there was the evidence which would uh, back up uh, 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 any attempt to have them also accepted, but it's based on the evidence, as with the submissions from these uh, uh, regulatory bodies. Okay. Uh, <coughs> finally, if I may, um, um, Minister, we, we have a written submission from the Forum of Boys and Girls Abused and Couriers Homes, which is very concerned about this, and uh, certainly, and it was just myself and the convener who were involved in uh, the last session with this um, legislation, which was seen as a, a, a a tremendous addition to the range of options. Now, the Scottish Human Rights Commission have been at the heart of uh, a lot of progressing issues of historic child abuse. Have they expressed a view in this? Because well, I, I met uh, with officials with the Scottish Human Rights Commission uh, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, uh, and uh, a number of issues were, were raised. I raised this issue. No comments were made at that time by the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and since that meeting, no comment has been received by them on this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Thank thank you. You. <clears throat> Reference was made to the Law Society and I think the Human Rights Commission. At stage one, the Minister will recall there was evidence to the effect that um, 
an apology they state from their experience it's not prejudicial to pursuers because in most cases there would be no apology forthcoming if it was admissible in proce uh, civil proceedings. Move on to, um, was it Oliver and then Fulton? Fulton then Oliver, sorry. sorry. Fulton, Liam, Oliver and Mary. I've got the order wrong. Thanks, Fulton. Indina. <clears throat> it's just a quick question for the Minister. There seems to be a, pardon me, a general consensus that the teaching, uh, the health uh, agencies uh, should have an exemption. Did the two other agencies, the SSSC or the GTC, um, have any view on the fact that their members are often involved in health professions or health settings themselves, particularly the SSSC, where um, a significant portion, if not a majority, would be health professionals and therefore the same, um, the same issues may apply as with the others. I know the GTC would maybe be less so, but given that there is teaching and health settings as well, I wonder if that was something that came in to any of the discussions. I, I don't think per se, but obviously in terms of the actual nature of, of the processes and the, 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 the initial registration and then fitness to practice uh, proceedings that may ensue thereafter, um, I, I guess in the nature of the professions concerned that uh, there may be certain similarities in work done and therefore that would lead to similarities in the nature of the fitness to practice uh, proceedings. But it is clear from the submissions made that they all shared the same concern that the, the uh, Act, if applied without the exception to them, would cut across their proceedings, which they say would diminish their ability to protect the public. Okay, uh, moving on to Liam. Thank you very much. Um, I know as Minister, you, you, you uh, earlier quoted Alison, Alison McInnes. I would um, share her concerns and, and, and clearly wouldn't want to distance myself from somebody who's immersed in the detail of this rather more than, than uh, I have been. But following up, I think, some of the line of questioning that John Finney came uh, up with earlier, it, it, it struck me as you were talking about the issue of, of insight that the regulatory bodies um, determination to address future uh, risk and, and the need to to um, maintain the coherence of the regulatory process, which I think you've referred to on a number of occasions. It did strike me as unusual that that wouldn't apply similarly in relation to the Law Society, the Chartered Accountants um, and, and a number of the other uh, bodies where you could, you can imagine a situation where a, a law firm may um, issue an apology on behalf of uh, one, of its, uh, one of its solicitors in, in much the same way as, um, for example, a, a, a school might issue an apology on, on, on behalf of the school for um, something that has happened and um, that subsequently be, would find itself perhaps uh, in, a, in a, um, a, a disciplinary process with an individual teacher. So I'm, I, like John, I'm rather struggling to understand how it is that they see themselves as, as, as um, not touched by this in the same way as uh, the bodies that, uh, that are listed in the SSI. Well, in terms of the Law Society, as Eleanor uh, said, they, they came back to us and said that they do not use apologies as such within their processes. As regards the others, they have, uh, we simply understand that they have not sought any uh, exception. Um, I think John Finney's point about uh, thereafter doing some follow-up to see in, the, in which case then um, how they intend to factor in the Apologies Act 2016 when it comes into force, if it comes into force uh, within their processes, I think is a very good uh, suggestion is something we're very happy to do because I can't I can't then give a definitive response to the member on the other bodies because it's it's, it's they haven't given us a statement of why they, they don't want to they just don't uh, have the same share the same concerns as the eight health regulatory bodies and the other two mm. uh, mentioned this morning and that is the information we have the, the only exception in that regard being the law society who did come back to say they don't use apologies in their system right. uh, uh, such that this would be an issue as as Eleanor I suppose explained. using that rationale the risk is either the Apologies Act will be deemed as not applying uh, to those regulatory bodies, or those regulatory bodies will simply seek an, um, a, a, an exception to, uh, to the Act. So in, in a sense, it, it, it does, I suppose, as the, as the convener was perhaps alluding to earlier, um, call into question to, to what extent this Act is going to be allowed to, to bite anyway. Um, 
regard to the others who, other bodies who, who I listed a couple of times who have not sought to be part of this uh, SSI, um, I, one would need to know the detail of their uh, individual processes, but as far as this SSI is concerned, uh, they are not seeking any uh, uh, exception to be made for them. With regard to the bodies that have expressly asked for an exception to be made, the eight health regulators, the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the Social Services Council for Scotland, they have explained why, in the nature of their processes, uh, they, they need to ensure the coherence and, and maintain the flexibility they have to look at an apology in different ways in the context of all the evidence that would be before them in, in a, any given uh, a case. And that is why they have shared the concerns that they have <laughs> that if the Act were to apply uh, to them without any exception, then it would impair their ability to police their profession, if you like, which would in turn diminish their ability to protect the public. Um, I, I, I think I, I can't quite see how if those regulatory bodies who appear unconcerned by this do so for the same reasons the Law Society, the apologies do not form uh, a part of the regulatory um, process at, at, at present, then I'm, I, I can't see how what effect this, this legislation is going to, not, this, not the SSI, but the, the, the Apologies Act, um, what effect that is going to have when all the bodies that it, it, it might um, touch upon uh, are then seeking uh, an exception for, for reasons I entirely understand. But in a sense, it, it does appear to kind of drive a, a coach and horses through, through the, the rationale for the Apologies Act in the first instance. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what I would say, though, is that um, with regard to the, the bodies who we are dealing with today who have asked, asked for the exception for the reasons that they have stated in quite some detail, uh, this, uh, this uh, issue in terms of the unintended consequences of the Act was recognised as early as Stage 1 uh, in the passage of the Apologies Act, and it was recognised in the Stage 1 report, it was recognised by the members of former colleague, uh, and it was accepted that... Uh, work would need to be done to uh, pave the way for an exception for these bodies. And what is happening today is that this SSI is doing that very thing. Uh, and in the list of the 10 bodies, we have also the Social Services Council for Scotland, the General Teaching Council for Scotland, on the basis that the rationale, uh, uh, the grounds for the exception for the eight health regulators is also the grounds for exception for the other two. Uh, and therefore, in the interests of good governance, it would be very difficult to argue that on exactly the same rationale, you could have eight but choose to reject two. That wouldn't really seem to be uh, a coherent way to deal with this. Uh, we don't have any idea or any inclination, any uh, understanding that there would be any clamouring coming after this for any further exception. I can't rule that out. I don't have a crystal ball, but nobody else has come forward. And we have been working on this for quite some time now and nobody else has come forward. Uh, and so hopefully today we can see uh, that some progress can be made and that the, the 10 bodies mentioned in the SSI who have uh, expressed concerns based on the same grounds uh, will be treated as having the same concern, which is ultimately, as I've said, to ensure that they have the ability to police their, their profession. I'll leave it there, but I mean, I think the committee might want to proactively pursue this with the other regulatory bodies as well as with the Human Rights Commission to, to establish what exactly their position is, but I'll leave it at that. Kate okay, Fulton, I believe you've got... Yeah, sorry, convener, it, it dawned on me. Um, after asking the question, I probably should have referred members to my register of interest as a, a member on the uh, Scottish Social Services Council. So apologies for that. Cheers. Julie noted now. Um, just in, in response to, to the Law Society, then I believe that it's because an apology, um, the idea that an apology gives good evidence of, of fault is not one that they, they recognise. Um, they're not reliable indicators of wrongdoing and certainly not under the terms of the definition. So I don't know if that helps Liam MacArthur any. We're on to Oliver and then Mary. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, does the Minister not think it's concerning that the legislation's almost become a sort of opt-out sort of piece of legislation for organisations where rather than uh, Parliament deciding uh, who it applies to, it's, it's whether or not organisations get in touch and say whether or not they'd like it to apply to them? 
I, I don't think that's really a fair, um, a fair description of, of the process here, which I have tried to explain, which was that in stage one of the passage of the Apologies Bill, in the stage one report, it was recognised uh, that there would need to be uh, work done to reflect the unintended consequences that would otherwise be the case for the two health regulators who had uh, flagged up this issue at that time. Uh, which were the GMC and the National, uh, the Nursery and Mid, uh, Nursing and Midwifery Council, uh, and in the context of that work, uh, further health regulators who had essentially the same concern based on essentially the same procedures uh, made their views known in terms of the work that was already flagged up uh, by Paul Wheelhouse, my predecessor in this post, at the stage three debate to uh, uh, pursue. Uh, a statutory instrument and that was made clear at the time of the stage three debate and in the further work that was done to to come up with the, the best approach to the SSI the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the Scottish Social Services Council uh, for Scotland made their their views known and on the basis that they have the same concerns based on this essentially similar procedures uh, the uh, in the interests of legal coherence uh, uh, the rationale for proceeding with the exemption for the eight health regulators uh, 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 it was deemed to be appropriate in terms of the, the same, uh, in essence, the same rationale for the other two regulators. And that was how the, the process has, has um, proce been proceeded with. And is there, I mean, obviously the bills not come into, or the Act's not come into force. Has there been any thought that maybe it would have been better to, to test it and see how it developed over time rather than exempt everyone before uh, proceedings even started? Well, I see in the stage three debate in the Apologies Act, uh, the Apologies Bill at that time, uh, the undertaking was given by the Minister uh, in the stage three debate on the record that there would be an SSI worked up uh, further to the section two provisions of the, uh, of the Bill uh, Now Act and that is what we are, have been in the process of doing and that is what we are here today uh, to, to uh, seek uh, the committee's approval for. My, sorry. At that point, can I read out exactly uh -huh. what the, um, yeah. the, minister, the minister said? I mentioned earlier concerns yeah, were raised at stage one regarding the effect of the bill on regulators of health professionals, such as midwifery, GMC and the Nursing and Midwifery Council. My officials have been working closely with the NMC and the GMC to find a solution to their concerns. It is clear from those discussions that an exemption for civil proceedings undertaken by health professional regulators bodies is needed and I repeat again health professional regulatory bodies is needed however my work is still required to establish exactly what form such an exemption should take and I would therefore like to take the opportunity to state my intention to use the powers of the Scottish ministers outlined under section 23 of the bill to add an exception for proceedings held by health professionals uh, regulators once the additional work has been included. So it was quite clear that having gone through all the evidence at stage one, the stage one debate, the amendments at stage two, the stage three debate where this was debated ad infinitum, that was the conclusion and the undertaken by the minister. And I do just refer the minister again to the submission from Quarriers who are saying that was agreed. Survivors knew what they were getting, and you're now going back on that. Well, I would say, again, to the member, firstly, that um, the, the reasons why the Social Services Council and the General Teaching Council for Scotland are in the frame now is because they have come forward to say that they have essentially the same concerns and that the rationale for accepting the eight health regulators applies to them uh, 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 in equal measure and in terms of uh, the due diligence that government is required to exercise in framing its legislation that is entirely in keeping with the discharge of our due diligence obligations with regard to the second issue I would reiterate again for the record because it's something I want people to be very clear about that the uh, the exception of these 10 reg regulatory bodies not institutions uh, not individuals but regulatory bodies in terms of their fitness to practice proceedings in no way cuts across the interaction process uh, in terms of the, uh, the ethos of what the Apologies Bill uh, could mean for survivors. It doesn't cut, cut across that in the slightest and I would wish to reiterate that for the record because I'm sure it is important 
uh, to reassure survivors that this government is absolutely determined to do everything we possibly can to ensure that they receive the acknowledgement that they deserve and the justice that they deserve. The regulator bodies are looking at an apology from an individual or someone on behalf of another individual. So it's a smoke screen to say it's a regulatory body. We're still getting back to the apology made by an individual under the definition of the Act. And there is nothing there that proves fault or liability or any wrongdoing whatsoever. But it does acknowledge something happens. It does uh, express uh, regret. And it does give an undertaking to look into And there would be nothing that would prevent institutions from proceeding with an apology Nothing whatsoever further to this SSI, absolutely nothing whatsoever. The, the, the fitness to practice proceedings can only be brought against somebody who is uh, registered as a member of the relevant body. They don't have jurisdiction to deal with people that are not members of their profession registered with them. So I think that's important to ensure there's no confusion there. But to repeat, this SSI does not, not cut across in the slightest the ability further to apologies at 2016, which was indeed in turn uh, 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 as a result of the uh, interaction process uh, to ensure that if that was the route that institutions wished to go down, then it should be facilitated that they could do so. And nothing in this SSI would make uh, uh, that uh, more difficult. Uh, yes. Other points? Um, I just wondered what discussions the Scottish Government had had with the two organisations in question around the possibility of them changing their procedures to incorporate the Apologies Act. Well, I, I'm not sure it's, it's for government in terms of the, the, the work that we've done here to go to any of these regulatory bodies, be it the GMC, the Dental Council, the NMC, the Social Services Council for Scotland, or the Gentle Teaching Council for Scotland, to say that they've got to change their uh, processes. I don't think that was really part of the due diligence that we were undertaking. If the member feels that these bodies uh, should have a, a different approach, uh, then he would probably have to ask his Westminster colleagues to pursue that matter because the regulation of much of this, in term, terms certainly of the health bodies, is uh, uh, regulated from London. But it wasn't really due diligence for us to go and tell these bodies that they had to change the procedure. Uh, rather, we would have to deal with the reality of the situation as we currently find it. And the way that we currently find the situation is that we have been advised by these 10 bodies that for them, the application of the Apologies Act 2016 would cut across the coherence of their fitness to practice proceedings, which would then in turn impair their ability to police their profession, which would in turn uh, limit uh, their ability to protect the public. I haven't had any detailed discussions with them beyond their submissions. You've just taken those at, at, you know, at, at, on the face of it. And, and not made any further inquiries around what... I, I don't know, are you, you suggesting know? that the submissions being made by the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the Scottish Social Services Council are not factual? I'm not suggesting they're not okay. factual. What I'm suggesting is if, if someone has a problem uh, with a particular piece of legislation, you know that the, the government that's coming to this committee to ask for a change to the legislation to make an exemption for a particular organisation might have had further discussions with those organisations to try and work out whether or not a change to the law was needed? Well, I, I think that the, 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 uh, the way round that this happened is that uh, the way I've explained that the, the, the debate was already ongoing at the time of the stage one debate, that for those bodies who had fitness to practice proceedings, there was a concern that there could be unintended consequences that the Apologies Bill now Act could cut across them in, in a way that would impair their ability, the regulator's ability. And in the context of that debate, as I've explained to the member, other health regulators came forward to say they were in exactly the same position. And then also these two additional bodies came through to say, to say that, much, and, much well, uh, they, it, it was a process that was ongoing and it, there was a clear undertaking as the convener indeed has just read out from the, my predecessor, Mr. Wheelhouse, to say that uh, an SSI, bodies. to say, sorry, that an SSI would be brought forward, which is uh, what we're doing today. 
uh, and uh, I would simply refer uh, the member to the detailed submissions of the regulators who have made written submissions, including in particular the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the Scottish Social Services Council. These are th their procedures as they currently stand. We are talking about introducing an SSI now, uh, and therefore this is the reality of the situation that we have to look at if the member is interested in, in pursuing matters in terms of, of uh, suggesting legislative change, mandatory legislative change to the procedures of regulatory bodies, I'm sure he'll be interested in, in pursuing that. So just for absolute clarity, you've not had any discussion uh, ahead of introducing this SSI with either of those two bodies? Yeah, officials yes, have in discussions. Have discussions yeah. with them, but I get, they presented the evidence of how they use apologies in their proceedings. They presented the case that apologies are a useful bit of evidence about what happens in someone's mind when something goes wrong. It's evidence of insight, insight into um, how much was this my fault, that, those kind of issues. And um, we've, we've taken that evidence from them as, as the, the value of an apology in their proceedings. You didn't ask them at that point any questions at all about whether or not you know, they felt that it was possible to change their, their processes. You just, um, you just... Well, I, I don't think, to be fair, it would be for the officials to do that. I, I mean, the, 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 the issue here is that an undertaking was given to proceed with an SSI that would reflect the unintended consequences of the application of the Apologies Bill Now Act to these, these kinds of regulatory processes. At that time, those identified were the health regulators, but it became clear that there were two others who have said that they're in exactly the same position, share the same concerns, uh, and therefore that is why we have framed the SSI, uh, draft SSI as it is uh, before the committee today. Because yeah, that really is my point, is the SSI isn't the only way to deal with unintended consequences. You know, it's possible to look at other parts uh, of, you know, of the regulatory process you know, to, to work at that. It just seems odd that you know, this is the, being presented as the only way uh, to get around some of these hurdles. I, I refer to the member again to the undertaking given at stage three that we would proceed with an SSI in the context of the due diligence obligation on government to proceed with drafting legislation in a coherent manner in the context of that work, it became clear that two other regulators were in the same position in essence and hence the rationale for excluding them would not uh, be uh, uh, evident uh, and therefore the list includes these 10 regulators as set forth in the draft SSI. A little concerned that um, there's been a suggestion that apology is establishing the extent of fault. An apology does not establish fault certainly not under Section 3, and it would need to be given under Section 3 that precise definition in order to, to be covered by the Apologies Act. Minister, perhaps it would help, and we could cut through this before I bring Mary Fee in. You give one example in your letter to me. As in a scenario where an individual teacher or social worker comes forward and apologises for past sexual abuse of a child, I would be alarmed if questions were not asked about their suitability to come and continue to, to practice their profession. And the GTCS and the SSSC were unable to have access to relevant evidence. If they came forward and um, apologise for past abuse, it would be a criminal offence and the apology would not apply. So can you give me another example of where the, the GTC being um, exempted would be disadvantaged? I mean, I have to say, uh, and perhaps it'd be useful for the record, that, that, that the point I was making there was in direct response to a letter I received from, from yourself, uh, convener dated the 3rd of May, uh, where you said uh, you raised uh, that specific issue. So it was actually responding to the specific issue that you yourself had raised. Uh, so I hope that's uh, clear. Uh, what I'm trying to... to Precise, I, I don't well, if you want me to read out your letter and my whole response, well, I'm quite happy just to do the that. Point but that you're responding to, that would be helpful. Uh, well, you, you've written a letter of the 3rd of May wherein yeah. you uh, suggest that this bill would cut across an effect uh, uh, where, in circumstances where abuse occurred in settings including boarding schools, other private schools and other institutional <laughs> settings where social services were involved in the child's case. Now what I've been trying to say is that if you look at the position of the interaction process which in turn was the genesis of the Apologies Act although the Apologies Act is not simply concerned with survivors but if you look at the genesis, the genesis was to facilitate institutions being able to apologise without fear of civil litigation. 
This SSI does not cut across that in the slightest. This SSI is concerned uh, with uh, uh, individuals who are uh, members of the relevant professions listed in the SSI uh, uh, and the fitness to practice proceedings that could be conducted against them. And that, I think, is again important to state again for the record because this SSI does not cut across the ethos of the interaction process in the slightest. <clears throat> I think the, the bit you're referring to, it's only occurred to me that I've received uh, more and more correspondence and I have some pretty horrendous stuff from a boarding school where if you exempt the GTC, this will never see the light of day. Can I just go in? Oh, I think that's, uh, if you, I may say so, I think that would be... If you would just, you, you have an opportunity to, to, to respond, Minister. I've listened very patiently. Um, the correspondence from the survivors of, sexual, uh, of childhood sexual abuse regarding the current Limitations Scotland Bill that exempting these two bodies will seriously disadvantage survivors who are seeking an apology for child sexual abuse. And if I could follow that up with what quarriers say, the exemptions of the GTC and social work would create classes of discrimination where some survivors may receive an apology but others do not. And this is a crucial point. There were serious feelings, uh, where there were serious feelings of both of these organisations in their duty of care to past victims of historic abuse. So it's the duty of care, not the direct responsibility, somebody saying, I committed um, or I, I, I was responsible or, or, um, or had, uh, was involved in, in child abuse. That would be criminal. It's the third party apology. Um, and the, the potential of a duty care. And they're saying then in response to that, these were sailing, serious failings by both these organisations in the duty of care and to pass victims of historic abuse and the Scottish Government is compounding this now with these exemptions, the third party exemptions. And then I'll bring Mary Fee in, I think we should wind this up. Did you want me to reply to that? Yes, please. Okay. Um, yes, so I hear what the, the member says. Uh, I think there's a number of important issues to, to address uh, here. Uh, firstly, the, the, the proceedings, the, the, first of all, the, the SSI applies to these 10 regulatory bodies. Within that, it applies to their fitness to practice proceedings, and that is the scope of the exception. It does not cut across the institution concerned, be it a school or a local authority, whatever. It does not cut across their ability to apologise, and I think that has to be made very clear indeed again. Uh, the Limitation Bill does not have any impact here whatsoever. The Limitation Bill sits within the general law of, of civil law of Scotland, and what it will seek to do is to lift the three-year time bar in the circumstances circumstances described in the Limitation Bill that we have uh, debated in committee at some length and also uh, in the Chamber uh, recently on the 27th of April. So there is no cut across with the Limitation Bill whatsoever. Uh, the idea that um, the, the, somehow the GTC would be uh, complicit in any, uh, any suggestion that uh, past behaviour should go unchecked or whatever the suggestion was, I may have picked up the member incorrectly, I think is unfair. Uh, I think what we should recall here is that we're looking at regulatory proceedings, fitness to practice proceedings conducted by these 10 bodies. We're not looking at anything wider than that. And to just say again for the record, to assure survivors that the ability as foreseen in the interaction process for it being made easier for institutions to apologise, to acknowledge what happened under their watch, under their duty of care. That, as regards uh, the uh, position of this SSI, is not impinged on in the slightest. It is not cut across in the slightest, and I want, want to again provide that reassurance to survivors who may be watching this morning. Mary Thank you, um, convener. Um, I absolutely understand the, the rationale behind the exemption for, for health organisations and, and the duty of, of, of candour. And that was something that was accepted as, as the bill progressed um, through Parliament last session. And I think to include um, two further regulatory bodies is, is moving away from, from the general principles um, of, of the bill. And I have a particular concern in relation to the Scot Scottish Social Services Council. Because if we think about the importance and the relevance of the Apologies Bill, and I don't think anyone sitting around this table could underestimate the impact that an apology can have 
for a survivor on, on their well-being and, and their mental health. And the, the importance that they placed in the Apologies Bill. And my concern would be if the Scottish Social, Social Services Council were included, and perhaps the Minister could um, give me some assurances on this, I would have a huge concern if a regulatory body could use this legislation to prevent them giving a survivor an apology, or if a survivor could look at this legislation, if the, the exception includes the, the, the so Social Services Council and the GTC, they could look at the legislation and think, well, I can't get an apology because this organisation is exempted. And if that is the case, if we fail one survivor, we have failed every survivor. I mean, I, I, I understand where the member is coming from, and I wish to provide the reassurance that the member is seeking. I, I think we have to go back also to um, the passage of the, the Apologies Bill, and firstly, and what was the basis for even talking about at that time accepting the fitness to practice proceedings of the General Medical Council and the Nursing and Midwifery Council? And in fact, it wasn't to do with the duty of candour. That was already the subject of a, a separate head of exception by way of the exception that is actually framed in, on the body of the, the bill itself. Uh, it was seen at that time that as an additional head of exception, you would have to have something that dealt with these fitness to practice proceedings, as otherwise there was an unintended consequence in terms of cut across. So that was uh, you know, how this came about. In terms of the uh, concerns that the member has raised, specifically about, for example, the Social Services Council, these bodies encourage apologies to be made. All they're saying is that as far as the Apologies Act is concerned and the way it is drafted and the way the apology is defined, they have a problem in, in, in regard to the fact that in terms of the Act, the apology can't be used in, in their proceedings if they're not accepted to the detriment of the individual. But in certain circumstances, it's not ruled out that that could be the case. For example, where... An undertaking has, an apologies been made, an undertaking has been given to do X, Y, Z to remediate, but that remediation hasn't taken place. So there are certain circumstances where an apology can be, uh, as part of the whole evidence before the, the body in that individual case, be used uh, uh, in a way that the Act wouldn't allow it to be used. And what these bodies are saying is that if this Act applies to their processes, then it will cut across their processes. That does not mean to say that individuals can't apologise. However, I think as the point that the convener made or another member made uh, uh, near the start of our deliberations this morning, um, the idea that if you were in one of these professions and you subsequently apologise for uh, 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 abuse, uh, that there wouldn't be immediately in train certain severe consequences. As far as the individual perpetrator is concerned, I think we all accept there would be uh, fairly immediate and significant consequences for the individual perpetrator. This does not cut across, however, and I think this is where I can give the member assurance that she's seeking, quite rightly, this does not cut across rather the ability of the institution, so the school, the local authority in terms of its social services department or whatever, to issue an apology without fear of reprisals under the uh, civil law. So I think that is where perhaps some confusion has arisen and I, I, I hope that I have been able to, to offer some uh, uh, assurance at least to, to the member. Uh, can I just ask very quickly, if this change isn't made, what will take precedence, the regulations of these organisations or the uh, section, relevant sections of the Apologies Act? The, the, therein lies the difficulty, because an undertaking was given on the floor of the Chamber of the Parliament uh, 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 that the, member, the convener has read out, so obviously we would need yeah, for, to reflect... For, for health organisations, uh, I think we've made that quite clear. Well, actually, um, the undertaking was encompassing the health regulators that were uh, anticipated at the time, so question marks would arise about the other health regulators, yeah. I guess, as, as one possibility. We would need to reflect further, because undertakings were made on the floor of the Chamber of the Parliament to uh, third-party organisations in Scotland, and as a good uh, government uh, uh, exercising uh, uh, reasonable uh, governance and good faith, one would have to, to consider where we went next with this. But I am hoping that the con committee, having heard uh, 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 responses to uh, their questions, which raised a number of concerns, and quite rightly so, I hope I have managed to address those concerns this morning. So you don't, you don't know whether the Apologies Act would apply or not? 
Well, I, we would have to take stock and consider what, what we do next, but it is difficult given that an undertaking was given to the, the Chamber and therefore to the country on the floor of the, the, the Parliament uh, during stage three of this bill, and it was accepted uh, uh, because the stage three, of course, was passed, and I think it was passed unanimously. Have you taken any legal advice on that point? Well, we obviously always act within uh, our legal advice and we will continue to do so. Obviously, uh, I can't, as a government minister, go into any particular legal advice because I'm not allowed by convention to do that. I'm sure the member yeah, no, is I know, I know that. that. That wasn't what I was asking. I was asking to confirm you to confirm whether or not you had taken legal uh, advice on this point. On which point? On whether or not the Apologies well, Act would apply to those organisations. I, I think we should you know, see what happens. I, 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 I think I'm also constrained in in explaining whether the substance of advice and whether advice is taken. I think that is the convention that applies to ministers. If that's not the correct application of the code, I'm prepared to stand corrected. Uh, I, I think we would have to reflect on where we go because these organisations in good faith have treated with the government uh, if uh, the, the, the view was that some are to be accepted but not others who have put forward exactly the same rationale. We do get into a kind of difficult it's, it's, position. Mm -hmm. It's a different rationale, though. Surely you'd accept that for non-health-based organisations? Well, no, it's essentially the same rationale in terms of their fitness to practice proceedings, and that's what okay. I've been trying to explain uh, this morning to, to the committee. Thank okay. you. Right, I think we've got as far as we can go with the discussion. Um, Minister, do you want to make any closing comments? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I think I've hopefully addressed the, the issues that have been raised. Agenda item number three, subordinate legislation, is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The delegated powers and the Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comment on it. The motion um, is that 05334 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Apology Scotland Act 2016 Executed Proceeding Regulation 2017 draft be improved. I invite the Minister to speak and move to the motion. Formally moved, Convener. Yeah. Um, and uh, do any members wish to speak? John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, um, you and I were involved in this process right from the outset, and we, we know that difficulties were identified. Indeed, this was uh, incorporated in the discussions at stage three, which have been uh, alluded to, with an undertaking to examine. Now, um, whatever reservations I may have about the two organisations, the presentation of their evidence, it clearly would be wrong to ignore what was emerging information, and that's why we are here now. I am very concerned about the perception of dilution um, but I think it's important, and it's not necessarily apparent from everything I've heard, that people do understand the purpose of, of the legislation that was passed. No one can be compelled to make an apology. It's very much an individual thing. And to the extent that individuals, institutions can, I believe many institutions should continue to, to make apologies. I, I've represented uh, police officers at various forums, uh, and in one, in, uh, one instance, I should stress, entirely in an individual capacity, I represented a social worker at a hearing, so I am familiar with some of the machinations of how things can end up being presented. Um, I'm disappointed that we don't know, but I'm reassured the Minister's going to come back, on whether institutions have reviewed their processes in light of this information, because to me, that's what a responsible organisation would do. It would be aware of the legislation that would respond accordingly. Um, the suggestion in the phrase used is substantial prejudice, um, and... Um, that could apply if we're not to pass this. Um, I think we do want the highest standards for uh, public sector workers. I'm concerned that any detriment to, to, to workers um, and that could result were we not to pass this. Uh, and for that reason, and with some reluctance, I'm going to support the uh, motion. Um, just, just to put on the record, the couple of things I've taken out of this, I now have some substantially greater understanding of uh, the background and where we now are. Um, I take great comfort from that institutions, schools, councils and so on and so forth are in no way deprived of the opportunity uh, to make apologies and free uh, from consequences of from doing so under the provisions of uh, uh, your Act convener. Uh, and I hope that uh, these institutions will take very close notice of what's been said here and continue 
to look for opportunities to bring forward uh, apologies where it's appropriate. I think the Courier's uh, input to the discussion has focused on institutions largely. Now, of course, individuals implement institutions' positions, but I think uh, institutions must continue to look seriously at uh, making appropriate apologies, and it's clear that what's before us today as a committee uh, leaves untouched the ability to make those apologies uh, free from um, legal retribution as a result of having done so. And that leaves the core of your very welcome act, uh, convener, uh, untouched, albeit uh, in relation to individuals who are otherwise governed by regulatory bodies. Um, we're striking a balance that I think is entirely appropriate. Thank you, um, Convener. I, I just oh, wanted sorry. to echo a point. I think it was Liam MacArthur made the point about the human rights organisation. I, I would have been um, more content this morning if we'd had a view from them on the impact of this. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I, I can't say that I'm confident with the inclusion of the, the additional organisations over and above the, the health organisations. Liam MacArthur. Thanks, Convener. I mean, I echo what um, Stuart and John have said in terms of the, 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 <coughs> the value of the exchanges this morning, I and mean, I think probably just reiterating what I said previously, I know the Minister's given a commitment to engage with um, some of the other regulatory bodies, but I think as a committee it would be a helpful exercise for, for, for us either to do that ourselves or, or monitor very closely um, the responses that come back from that, because I think that it would appear that uh, the understanding of the effect of the Apologies Act may not be as, as, as clear and uniform across the board as it might be, and I think we've probably got a useful role to play in trying to, to uh, push that out further. Um, I'll just make a contribution to the effect that this whole act um, came about from the cross-party group and survivors of uh, sexual abuse. It came when Professor Miller came to talk to the group and he explained that there was an apology act and legislation in other countries and that this could be very, very welcome and very valuable to survivors in giving them closure, in acknowledging that abuse had happened and, crucially, perhaps looking to make sure it didn't happen to others. And that's the raison d'etre behind the, um, the Act. During the passage of the Bill, it became clear that the government was introducing a duty of candour. That would be for health professionals. And that that duty of candour meant they would apologise that would be expected as part of the duty of candour, and that that apology would be admiss admissible in civil proceedings. And during these proceedings, um, the passage of the bill, it was clear and it was stated that it was obvious the duty of candour provisions and the Apology Act provisions could not coexist. On that basis, health provisionals were exempted and that's taken as a read today, that there are eight people on this list who are health provisions. However, the, ability, uh, the Limitations Act, um, as the, the Minister says, does remove a barrier, a time barrier to um, survivors. It's also been recognised that a lot of people will not go down the legal route and have no wish to go down the legal route. All they want is an acknowledgement an expression of regret, and perhaps to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else, if they possibly can. And that's what this Apology Act does. And I refer the Minister again to the submission from the former boys and girls abused in quarriers' homes, where they go as far as to say it would appear that the survivor community of the Scottish Government has broken an agreed commitment promise to implement the elements of the interaction plan. Because again and again, the Apologies Act is looked as an alternative, an effective alternative for these people. And by including, again, I, I, I reiterate to the Minister, the GTC and social work the government is not only going back on what it said previously about only including professionals because of the duty of candour, it is also now discriminating again against survivors by creating two classes, somewhere our apology can be given and now under the GTC and the SSSW where it cannot. 
And while the minister and Stuart Stevenson has referred to this, that he's comforted that institutions and schools can give an apology, bricks and mortars do not give an apology. What gives an apology is a person. And under the provisions in this SSI, the minister is now deterring people from coming forward with that apology because they would be perhaps, possibly, deemed to have a duty of care that they had not exercised. And if there's any possibility, it's going to act to their detriment, which is what Section eight, uh, 1 is all about. They will not come forward with that apology. And under the Section 3, the definition in no way um, talks about fact, talks about any fault, the apology under that is not admission of fault. So on that basis, then, um, and if no one else wishes to speak, and I don't think they do, I invite the minister to wind up. Um, I, I, I think, obviously, I appreciate your time is marching on for your rest of your committee work this morning, and I think Many members have made very trenchant points, and which I've listened to very carefully. Uh, I would just pick up on one final point, which is to say, uh, again, for the record, because I think it's very, very important to survivors who may be listening this morning or who may read the record uh, of this meeting uh, in due course, which is to say, again, that this SSI does not cut across in any way, shape or form the ability of institutions to apologise. Indeed, uh, institutions are bricks and mortars and it would be a person exercising that, uh, uh, that um, uh, taking up that opportunity on behalf of the institution. But this is not concerned with that. This is concerned with fitness to practice proceedings uh, and the, the only circumstance that, that would encompass was where the individual was the perpetrator. Uh, and of course, if the individual were the perpetrator, there would be other consequences, which I think we recognise would, would kick in fairly quickly. So this does not impact on institutions uh, to take up the facility of the Apologies Act to uh, apologise. And indeed, uh, I, I would uh, encourage that uh, uh, in the interests of the survivors receiving the acknowledgement that they deserve uh, and, of course, the justice that they deserve. And I think uh, I would probably end my comments there, convener. Right. Um, I now put uh, the motion. The question is that motion 05334 in the name of Annabelle Ewing uh, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Show of hands. For what? Four. Four. <laughs> Those against? The result is those in favor, seven. Those against, four. Um, that concludes consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Um, for information, the committee has until the 23rd of May to report to the Parliament. Um, now, given this has been a very long and my own personal interest in the debate, I uh, propose that the report and the discussion um, the final report should be passed to all members so they can approve it. Is so agreed? agreed? Thank you for that. And with that, I thank the Minister for attending and suspend briefly to allow the Minister and her officials to leave.
Bill. Agenda item four is our opening evidence session on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill with the Scottish Government's Bill Team. And I welcome Phil Lamont, Bill Team Leader, Kelvin Philpott and Patrick Down, Bill Team Members and Catherine Scott, Director of Legal Services um, with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerks, and paper three, which is a spice briefing. And I'll remind uh, members again that the officials are here to explain policy, not defend it. Not defend it. With that, can I invite questions from members? Mary. Uh, Two things that I wanted to, to raise today. The first was about the non-harassment orders. Um, now, we'd heard, uh, actually, in term, when we did the, held our inquiry into the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, we heard direct evidence from victims of domestic abuse, and we received written evidence and this call for evidence regarding that as well. And they were requesting that non-harassment orders be imposed. Uh, and that they should be, con in addition to them being considered in all cases. I think we'd also seen that in relation to what's been happening in England and Wales, we see that, um, oh sorry, that's a different point there. Um, but so really in relation to the non-harassment orders, uh, how would you respond to the evidence that we have received in relation to that and the request that they actually be imposed in all cases? Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to respond on that. Um, it might be helpful just to confirm what, we do, what we're doing in the bill, which is to change the current position, which is a general provision that applies in respect of non-harassment orders, so that at the moment the way it works is that where an offence, any offence, involves misconduct towards another person, the court does have the ability to impose a non-harassment order in order to protect that person from the perpetrator, but that requires an application by the prosecutor. The court at its own hand cannot impose such an order. It has to have the application first. What we are doing in this bill is changing that general provision and specifically for, if approved by Parliament, the new domestic abuse offence and also the existing domestic abuse aggravation that was created last year in the Abusive Behaviour Act to so that an application by the prosecutor is no longer required and that the court must consider whether to impose an order. From your question, we are aware that some stakeholders consider that the bill perhaps should go further and actually say not only should the court consider, it should just impose in all situations. Um, we can understand where that desire comes from, but we do think, given how we've approached it in terms of the bill, that the correct approach is to still leave discretion with the court. Um, not least because there may be some cases where involving domestic abuse where the circumstances are such that actually, for a variety of reasons, the no a non-harassment order may not be the right approach to the court to make. And we think discretion should always lie with the court to understand the facts and circumstances of the case and make the decision. But what we're doing in the bill is saying that the prosecutor no longer has to bring it to the court's attention. It is for the court themselves, bec because it's a domestic abuse case, to make that decision. I think it was just particularly concerning because in the evidence that, that was supplied in the written evidence to the committee, I think we see um, of 502 cases, well this was Hamilton Shed of Court in particular that's mentioned there, only 33 non-harassment orders were issued and we heard of the experience of uh, victims then having to take the process to the civil courts uh, and take the route that way which is a lot more expensive um, and I, th I think that it is quite concerning that that is the case and that very few are issued so far. And I think my only concern would be that if it's left to the discretion of the courts uh, without that going any further, that we could still see that, you know, relatively few non-harassment orders being issued. I suppose there is a question about what proportion would you expect in domestic abuse cases and there's probably arguments and I'm sure you'll have evidence from stakeholders in due course. Um, what we think we are doing in this bill is giving what I would suggest is a heavy hint to the court about how to approach non-harassment orders in the context of domestic abuse cases. I do accept though that it doesn't go as far as some stakeholders might like in terms of requiring them to impose, but it certainly moves on from the current position, which is the court can't do anything until the prosecutor applies, and we're saying that's no longer the case. 
In relation to some of the other evidence we received, um, for example, children first, they talk about even taking that a step forward and using not extending non-harassment orders to include children uh, specifically. And I was just wondering uh, what your views were in relation to that evidence. It's, I think that's a reference to the way the bill is drafted, the, the provision that relates to non-harassment orders links back to the existing provision in the 19th Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which refers to a non-harassment order being available where a victim is subject to misconduct. Um, and there was actually a court case a couple of years ago where a court um, applied an on or ordered a non-harassment order, both in terms of a partner who'd been abused, but also their children. And that was overturned on appeal because it was found that the court had um, gone too far in terms of interpreting the existing law. What we're doing in this bill still limits it to um, the partner or ex-partner, in other words, the direct victim of the abuse. And I think what Children First and one or two other stakeholders I think have raised have suggested that because we've got a child aggravation in the bill, perhaps the policy could go further so that where the domestic abuse offence is proven and a child was involved in that abuse, a non-harassment order should also be available in the context of those children. And that's certainly something we're happy to consider your own views and stakeholders as you go through stage one scrutiny. Perhaps the provision in this area could go a bit further. Yeah, because obviously that's something that we still have to explore uh, as we go through. Um, another point that is raised is about the, the training of police forces. Uh, sorry, that was the example I was getting confused with earlier. About the forces in England and Wales. So eight out of 22 police forces in England and Wales have not charged a single person uh, with the offence according to a Freedom of Information request. Uh, nine forces have made two or fewer charges since the new law came into effect in England and Wales in December 2015 and it lists those authorities there. And there's a concern that after the new offence has been introduced, obviously there's been, it seems, really, relatively few cases taken forward. I'd just be wondering what your uh, views were on that and how we can ensure that if this bill does progress and the legislation is passed, uh, that there is adequate training in place for uh, all police officers and you know, greater public awareness of the changes that have been made. I think, I think, I think that's, a, that's a fair point. I wouldn't want to speak for Police Scotland. I'm sure they'll give evidence in due course um, and explain how they're going to approach ensuring that officers on the ground are aware of what's contained in the new offence if it's approved by Parliament. We've worked with, amongst others, Police Scotland in developing the offence, so they're certainly, Police Scotland are very well aware of the new offence that's contained in this bill. They also assisted us in the development of the financial memorandum, which does include estimates for costings for training of police officers. Um, we are certainly, um, if Parliament approves this um, new offence, not going to rush the introduction of the offence. I think the reference to England and Wales is obviously their coercive control offence. Um, I wouldn't want to speak for what's happened down there. Um, but in terms of working with the key stakeholders in Scotland, we would make sure that as much as possible Police Scotland are entirely aware of the timeline so that they can actually prepare the training of their officers so that the ones who are actually dealing with domestic abuse on the ground are aware of how the new offence works, what things are new that they need to look for in terms of the investigation of domestic abuse, the things that the Crown Office, obviously the Crown Office themselves and Lord Advocate will give guidance to the Police Scotland about how the investigation of such cases, and again I'm sure that's something you want to explore with the Crown Office when they give evidence. Um, but we're certainly working closely with those partners t so that they have awareness and they are very clear what's in this bill as it stands. We'll see how it goes through the parliamentary scrutiny. Um, but I think the risk you, you raise about what appears to have happened down south is one that we're very well aware of and we obviously want to avoid as much as possible. Okay, thank you. And just one final question. Uh, in a few submissions, there had been mentioned that the law should be compliant with the Istanbul Convention. So if the legislation uh, is passed, uh, will it be compliant with the Istanbul Convention? Again, sorry, I think that's a reference to part of the Istanbul Convention um, contains a, a clause or a provision that requires what's called extraterritorial jurisdiction on certain offences. Um, now, obviously, this offence, the Istanbul Convention was um, agreed a few years ago, so this offence postdates that, but if Parliament does agree it, there is a question about whether the offence should carry extraterritorial jurisdiction, so that, for example, a couple who, uh, there's incidents of domestic abuse 
that are taking place in this country, but they happen to travel to another country, perhaps on holiday, um, could they, they also be included so that a Scottish court could heal, hear a prosecution of the totality of the abuse? And again, with, um, with that suggestion, we're obviously happy to hear your views in due course whether you think the bill could be extended in that way. Extraterritorial jurisdiction under the criminal law is an exception to the normal approach of these things, but there are certain offences that currently have extraterritorial jurisdiction, and clearly within the context of the Istanbul Convention and UK government's considerations of whether to ratify, it's a very relevant consideration that I'm sure you'll want to consider in due course. Okay, thank you. Rona, followed by Liam. Thank you. Um, yes, I just wanted to pick up on Mary's um, part of uh, Mary's uh, question about the child, about children's, uh, the effect of domestic abuse on children. Um, there have been concerns, um, you know, the offence is just restricted to partners and ex-partners abuse, and there have been concerns from a considerable number of the children's charities that perhaps um, the effect hasn't been recognised enough and the government have um, sought to address this by providing an offence, saying that the offence will be aggravated where it involves a child. I just wondered if you, what your views on are, whether you think it's strong enough, do you think an aggravator is addressing the children, the effect on children enough, given that we all know the damage domestic abuse, abuse does to children? Okay, I think the, the Scottish Government obviously recognised that growing up in an environment where domestic abuse is taking place can harm children, um, and the aggravation is intended to go in a way to recognise that and ensure the fact that children were either um, involved in the abuse or that behaviour was directed at them in the course of the abuse, or that they were uh, present when the abuse was taking place so that they um, saw or heard the abuse is formally recognised by the criminal law. Um, in terms of how it might go further, it's worth remembering, of course, that there are criminal offences concerning child abuse and neglect that would continue to apply whether they occur in the context of someone who is abusing their partner and those children or just the children. Uh, I'm aware that um, some of the children's stakeholders think that there is a need to update the law, reform the law, to reflect the particular, almost a kind of domestic abuse of a child type offence. Um, in terms of whether it could be included in this bill, our concern was that um, the definition of abuse that we have come up with is very much focused on behaviour that would be abusive when directed by someone towards their partner or ex-partner, and to extend that to this, the uh, parent-child relationship or, or partner of parent and child relationship without for further consultation and without probably adjusting the definition to take account of the very different nature of that relationship would not really be appropriate and could risk criminalising behaviour that should not be criminal. It is perhaps also just worth saying that in response to the two previous consultations the Scottish Government did, the first one was on the general principle of having an offence. One of the questions that we asked was what, what relationship should be covered and while there were certainly views offered that it should go beyond what's ended up in the bill, there was quite strong support for an offence which related to partners and ex-partners because there's such a particular dynamic to that type of abuse. Now, that's clearly what we've provided for in the bill. Um, and in addition to what Patrick said, it's probably worth drawing the committee's attention to the statement made by the Minister for Early Years and Childcare at the start of March in Parliament on the Child Improvement Protection Programme. One of the elements of that announcement was, um, or one of the elements of that statement was to look at the Section 12 offence in the Children and Young Persons Act 1937, which children, stakeholders and others consider needs to be updated to reflect, amongst other things, the modern experience of what we understand abuse of a child to be, um, and that commitment has been given. So picking up on what Patrick's saying about the difficulties perhaps of adapting what's in our bill, there is a, a process underway for the Scottish Government to look at that area. I wondering if um, you would consider maybe clarifying it, you know, the, the policy that you're taking in this bill, just to make it a wee bit clearer, basically what you're telling us here, um, just to allay some of the concerns from the charities that, you know, it's, it's not just been put in there as a, uh, an afterthought? So I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't suggest it is. I think Section 4, the aggravation, is a very important provision. Um, it very specifically tries to acknowledge the harm that can be caused by domestic abuse on a child. Um, also, accept, 
picking up on Patrick's point, which is if there's direct abuse of a child, that can be already be prosecuted potentially under different laws. But what the aggravation does is very clearly say that if a perpetrator undertakes domestic abuse, they've committed the new offence. If, however, in committing that offence, they either use a child in some way by directing behaviour at it to get at their partner or actually um, make ensure that the or they commit the abuse in such a way that the child is aware, is present, that it's taking place, that can be harmful. And that, what the aggravation will do, if proven, is require the court to consider whether or not the sentence that otherwise would have been imposed should be enhanced, which we think is, is, is an appropriate way of acknowledging the harm that such abuse can have on a child. Totally understand what you're saying. I'm just wondering if we could maybe just strengthen it a wee bit in the wording. That's, that, that's all. Uh, supplementary on that point, maybe. Thank you, Convener. And, and you, you, you briefly mentioned the question I was, I was about to ask you because it's, it, it was raised um, as a concern during our, um, our, our preliminary evidence um, sessions, and it's about coercively using a child within a relationship to cause harm to a partner. Mm -hmm. Now, will, will, this, will this piece of legislation cover that, and will it be explicitly stated that that will be deemed as, as domestic abuse? I think um, Patrick may want to pick up, but I'll, I'll just mention briefly, without getting into the technicalities of the bill, Section 2.2b. Section 2 is about a definition of what is abusive behaviour, which is one of the essential elements of the offence. And if you look at Section 2.2b, abusive beha the definition of abusive behaviour includes behaviour directed at B, i.e. the partner or ex-partner, at a child of B, or any other person. So the inclusion of the words at a child of B is an attempt to be very clear that we are aware that one of the most common ways that abuse can be perpetrated, if it's not directly um, at the partner or ex-partner, it is through the child or children of that person. And that's why those words appear, because strictly speaking, you could argue any other person covers children. So we've actually put that in specifically to give a very clear signal under the law, this is what our understanding is it's one of the most common ways that abuse can be perpetrated through a third party, and that's why we wanted to put it out in the face of the bill. Thank you. Liam? Following up those issues for, for a second, um, I, I know that the Serious Crime Act 2015 does apply uh, more generally, so I, I appreciate the consultation, the two consultations that have taken place in relation to this specific uh, legislation have come to a, to a different view. I'm, I'm a little... Um, unclear as to why that's the case. Is, the, is it the, 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 the view that were it to take a broader definition of abuse in a domestic setting that could involve children, but equally it could, be, it could involve elder abuse, it, um, a, 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 um, a coercive or controlling relationship with a, with a parent or a grandparent in, in a household. Was it felt that by including those sorts of scenarios, somehow it dilutes the impact or its ability to, to strike at those um, instances of abuse of a partner or an, or an ex-partner? What, what was the rationale for it? Sorry, to, just to clarify, the, um, the Serious Crime Act, I think, is wider, as you say, in that it applies not only to partners and ex-partners, but to other members of the same family living in the same household. So, as you say, it would cover potentially abuse of a a grandparent if they were living in the same household, abuse of um, abuse even between si adult siblings. Um, the reason we've taken the approach is that we think, certainly based on the evidence from stakeholders during the two consultations, they think there is a particular um, form that abuse of partners take that is different from these other kinds of abuse, and also that it would keep the uh, the definition of abuse in line with the definition of domestic abuse that we use, that the Scottish Government's wider definition of domestic abuse. Um, I think it is reasonable to say that the particular kinds of coercive control that can happen between people who are or have been in an intimate relationship do tend to be different from abuse between adult family members. Um, that there is a distinction, but in a sense, um, I, what I'm not clear about is, is why, um, in terms of bringing forward legislation that uh, I think covers both areas where there is already um, uh, there is already provision within within the law as well as extending it, 
why the opportunity hasn't been taken to, in a sense, broaden it to cover those examples, which may be um, maybe less in number uh, and, and, and absolutely are different in, in, in nature. But nevertheless, I think by any definition, it could, could be described as abuse within a domestic context. I think just picking up again, I'm sorry, on Pat, what Patrick was saying. Um, obviously, we did, to a certain extent, follow the views that were offered in the consultation, which was not, I appreciate not universally, but there was relatively strong support for restricting it to partners and ex-partners. The way we've now approached it, I think we've got certainly in section two, which contains the what we call the list of effects, in the same way that we don't think that would be, you know, you can just adapt that very easily to context of abuse of a child. I think it would need some work, but that's not to say that it's not possible to do that. Um, I think we are aware, however, more generally, that this, this offence is quite a novel offence. There are certain elements of it that you know, I'm sure will be scrutinised very closely in the coming weeks. Um, and we, um, and ministers, were, were, were keen just to focus it on, on the, the, the established understanding of domestic abuse in the context of partners and ex-partners. I, I, I take what you what you're saying and the explanation for it. I, I, I understand, and what you've got back through the consultation is clearly steered you a, and, and ministers in a particular direction. The, the risk, I suppose, is that uh, there may be those who are arguing a different case. I mean, each concern would be an obvious example. There may be others yeah. whose voice within that is not necessarily as as, as clear. That the numbers articulating that position are perhaps not as as numerous. But nevertheless, in terms of um, uh, the opportunity this bill presents, the arguments that they are putting are 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 are. are pretty compelling and that, that they're being set aside at this stage because um, of the, the kind of overwhelming numbers um, that are arguing for, for a, a more sort of targeted approach in terms of the legislation. That to me seems perhaps at best a missed opportunity but, per, but possibly even um, leaving uh, older people that, that find themselves in a domestic uh, abuse situation. Um, at, at heightened risk. That our focus is, is on this at the moment for understandable reasons, but while we're focused on this, inevitably we're not, we're not focusing the attention on, on, on other areas. I mean, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with anything you've said there. I suppose coming back to this being a relatively novel offence, perhaps part of it will be to see how it actually, if approved by Parliament, works in practice so that the lessons can be applied to different situations in terms of different, for example, different relationships. I think that probably goes for potentially looking at domestic abuse of a child, domestic abuse of uh, um, between siblings, perhaps, I don't know, elders, um, you know, vulnerable um, people who are living with, with parents. So I think there are potentially lessons to be learned um, but obviously we have, as you've suggested, have generally been guided by the, the general view from stakeholders, which is to focus on the established definition of domestic abuse. And that's why this is the, you know, an offence of domestic abuse. But I, certainly I, I don't think the government would, um, and I don't want to speak for ministers, I'm no doubt you'll explore it with the Cabinet Secretary in due course. But um, certainly it's not about closing the door, but this is, this is what we're doing in this bill. Just touch on uh, briefly one of the other apparent distinctions between the, the Serious Crime Act 2015 and the approach being taken in this this bill in relation to um, uh, be behaviour that does not in fact cause a partner or ex-partner to suffer physical or psychological harm, uh, whereas the Serious Crime Act, as I understand it, requires um, that that harm to be committed. And what, can you maybe explain what the, the rationale is for, for, in a sense, Having a ha having a crime where the the harm hasn't yet been been committed, um, which to some extent I think to the lay person probably would seem the the, the logical approach. Yep, sure. Um, the test that's in the bill is whether the accused's behaviour was such that it would be a reasonable person would think it likely to cause the victim to suffer physical or psychological harm. Um, so in a sense, it's putting an objective. Um, it's, it's placing an objective test and it's focusing the, the court very much on what did the accused do. Um, therefore, if the accused behaviour was such that it was very likely to cause the victim to suffer harm, the fact that the victim might have turned out to be especially stoical um, and unexpectedly was not harmed by the behaviour um, would not prevent a conviction occurring. And equally, it ensures that there isn't as much risk of for want of a better word, re-victimising the victim by forcing them to 
come to court and explain exactly how their partner's behaviour negatively affected, uh, harmed them, either physically or psychologically, um, in order to ensure that a conviction takes place. Now, in many cases, I imagine that in practice, the evidence led probably will include that, but it ensures that it's not absolutely necessary um, in all cases for a conviction to take place. Is there not a risk, though, that it, it either sets the bar too low um, or, or that, that a, a, a case is brought almost as part of an exercise in, in, uh, in exacting some kind of retribution within a relationship that's not functioning as it should, but, but necessarily be abusive um, solely in one, in one direction. I mean, I, I, I'm, as I say, just I, I think from my perspective, it strikes me as slightly unusual for, for, for a situation where um, there isn't sort of demen demonstrable harm having been, having been caused. Yeah, it's perhaps helpful maybe if I just run through the sort of exactly how the offence can be committed. Um, so there's almost three tests that have to be met. The first is that the accused has to engage in a course of behaviour that is abusive of their partner or ex-partner. And the second test then is that the court then have to be satisfied that that course of behaviour is likely to cause the victim to suffer physical or psychological harm. And then finally, there's a third test that the accused must either intend to cause that harm or else that they must be reckless as to whether that harm is likely to result. Um, there's then a defence that the um, accused's behaviour was, in the particular circumstances of the case, reasonable. Now, you mentioned this case, uh, this problem with um, counter-allegations of people making you know, allegations of somebody who's accused of abuse themselves says, well, I was being abused. And I don't deny that's a possibility. Certainly, if you were think, to speak to the police or prosecutors, they would say these counter-allegations are all a feature in domestic abuse cases as it stands. So it's not something that the police and prosecutors are unfamiliar with, and they obviously will have to have their ways of dealing with that and identifying where they think there is merit in these allegations and where they think they are being made maliciously and there's not good evidence that somebody is in fact a victim of abuse. John Finney. Uh, th thank you. It's, uh, it's just to pick up further on, the, on that point there. And uh, I mean, there'll always be challenge around definitions and uh, it's particularly um, in relation to the defence of behaviour that was reasonable in all the circumstances. And, and uh, the, the position of Scottish Women's Aid is that the defence might uh, risk providing a, a legal cover for co coercive behaviour under the guise of reasonableness. Um, what thoughts are given around the challenge of that? I know everything's about interpretation, but this seems to be at the nub of a lot. I think, as you say, um, the exact definitions and, and um, meanings of individual words is quite a, a tough area around this. And almost inevitably, um, in order to ensure that um, behaviour that should not be criminal um, is not inadvertently criminalised, which is part of the purpose of the reasonableness defence, there will always be cases where somebody who actually is abusing somebody will try to make the case that their behaviour was in fact reasonable. And in those cases, it will be for prosecutors to, um, to try to disprove that that was the case and to show that the claim that a, a, an accused behaviour was reasonable is, is not in fact the case. Um, Perhaps uh, <coughs> in relation to what the committee did recently about sexual abuse and we, we did private interviews with survivors, a quite harrowing testimony and in relation to, to, to one gentleman that myself and others interviewed, what struck us was that um, some things that we found pretty horrendous because they were quote normal, the individual didn't themselves see them as, as abusive. Uh, is, are you confident that's going to get picked up in the way that, the, that this is laid out? Well, I, think that the, I know that's a big ask, but yeah. I'm asking anyway. Like. I, mean, I, I think perhaps in, in some ways almost the biggest uh, barrier there is that the victim has to recognise that the, um, what they're suffering is not normal and that to some extent is about a public awareness um, effort that may be required um, when, even when um, the new offence comes into a force. Um, in terms of police and prosecutors being aware, I think that actually that's perhaps much less of a problem in that... Um, they will be much more aware that just because a victim might conceivably have been conditioned to see very abusive behaviour as somehow normal, it will not seem normal to everyone else. Um, so I think 
in some ways, the biggest barrier there is going to be the, that, encouraging that initial reporting to the police so that um, it, the abuse can be identified and prosecuted. And I would just pick up, I think that's one of the policy goals of this legislation, which is to try and reflect within the offence our modern understanding of what is domestic abuse. At the moment, individual incidents of domestic abuse have to be prosecuted. If they can be prosecuted together by separate charges under general legislation, and certainly the, the relevant effects that we've included in Section 2 in terms of the effects that behaviour can have on the, on the partner or ex-partner, one of the benefits of that, is, in our view, is that it actually perhaps will help people understand, I am being abused. They can, I know they probably won't study the words on the page, but organisations like Scottish Women's Aid and others can help show them that the criminal law actually reflects, oh, I am actually being abused in a way that at the moment some people may not even recognise it as, be, as been suggested. Or at the very least, they may recognise it, but don't think that they're going, the justice system is going to respond appropriately. So that's one of the, the aims of trying to capture within this offence the totality of what is domestic abuse. Uh, can I ask you, the, the Police Scotland have done tremendous work with serial offenders going back at um, abusers who have um, abused a, a series of partners over a prolonged period. Is there any element of this, particularly with regard to the coercive behaviour, that could be have a retrospective application? Um, I think the short answer to that is, is no, um, in that you can't, I mean, as a general principle, you can't criminalise behaviour that was not criminal at the time, time it took place. So I think behaviour that occurred before the offence comes into force would have to be prosecuted using the law that was in force at that time. Um, but you might want to speak to the, the prosecutors if you're, I don't know if you'll take evidence from them later as to whether they think there would be any scope to um, libel behaviour that would clearly be criminal under any law using this single offence, but I, I think even there, they would probably be very reluctant to do so. And I think the law will always be the law that was in force at the time the behaviour took place, is alleged to have taken place. I feared you would say that, yes, okay. Thank you very much indeed. I just wanted to follow up what John Finney has raised in relation to normal and make the see if we can see the distinction between what is normal and what is normalised. In other words, if behaviour that anyone outside the relation, uh, the, the overwhelmingly outside the relationship, would regard as abnormal, but because of the nature of the relationship has within the relationship become normalised to seem normal, would that process of normalisation of what people outside the relationship would regard as abnormal be in and of itself? some potential evidence of the abusive nature of the relationship. Now, that's a bit Sir Humphrey-ish, so hopefully you get my point. <laughs> I certainly think, in terms of raising awareness, it's not just about raising awareness with people who might directly be victims of abuse. It's also those who know family, friends, etc. They can perhaps see, as you've suggested, something that the person who's at the centre of it cannot see. So... The fact that if this offence um, is approved, it is, it, we think it will become much clearer what is domestic abuse under the criminal law, and that should hopefully be an advantage. And of course, in that situation, as is currently the case, there's nothing to stop someone going you know, to the authorities at the moment to raise concerns, and then it's for the police obviously to respond as, as appropriately um, to look into the matters. So I think it's, um, yeah, I, think, I wouldn't disagree with what you just said. Just to close it off, part of the policy intention is to empower those outside the relationship and observing the relationship to have a way of intervening to protect someone inside a relationship who does not realise the extent to which they are being abused. I would say it doesn't do, the bill doesn't do that explicitly, but through the awareness being raised of what is domestic abuse, hopefully that might be a beneficial... Just to be quite clear, I was asking whether that was the policy intention. It's certainly the policy intention for, for potential victims themselves and those that may know potential victims. Yeah. Um, the Law Society, Glasgow Bar Association, the Scottish Police Federation, Andrew Tickle, who's an academic, um, have all... Um, express some uncertainty about the bill and one of the reasons they, they did express um, some uncertainty 
was what they perceived as a lack of evidence. There is a gap in the law which requires to be closed. Could you comment on that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if you've, um, the background to this is that uh, there was a speech back in 2014 by the then Solicitor General who had highlighted what she saw as concerns about a gap in the law in terms of domestic abuse and the ability of prosecutors to prosecute long-term course of conduct type abuse. So as a result of that, in 2015, the Scottish Government um, did a consultation seeking views on whether stakeholders thought there was a gap in the law. And the message that very much came back from that consultation was a couple of things. Firstly, this reflection of the Solicitor General's concern about the problems of prosecuting sort of long-term course of conduct domestic abuse, um, given the current law's focus on individual incidents of, for example, assault or threatening and abusive behaviour. And the second was the concern that while it was reasonably easy to prosecute, for example, physical assault or overtly threatening behaviour using the existing law, it was much more difficult to prosecute this kind of insidious, coercive and controlling behaviour, this kind of psychological abuse, and that only a change to the law would make that um, practical to do so, and that it couldn't easily be done using the existing law. It more or less spelling it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in relation to the accused state of mind, the bill provides that the offence may be committed intentionally or recklessly, as some of the members have already alluded to. Can you expand on what this would actually mean in practice? Yes. Um, the reason that we have come with a, a to use the, the legal term, a mens rea of intention or recklessness is, is to some extent twofold. Firstly, um, proving an accused intent was to cause harm to somebody may actually be very difficult. They may always be able to turn around and say, well, I didn't actually mean to harm them. And it might be very difficult to disprove that claim. And secondly, I think if a reasonable person would think, well, that was always going to be the likely result of their behavior, then it's almost irrelevant whether they intended to cause the harm. If anybody, if they, if they knew or ought to have known that that harm was likely, then I think it's reasonable that the criminal law should apply regardless of whether it was actually their intent in, the, in their behaviour, because I suspect a lot of um, perpetrators of this kind of long-term abuse might in their own minds see their behaviour as perfectly reasonable. Um. Okay, that's hard, uh, good to get on record. And can I just ask one last bit? Um, Section 8 provides a maximum custodial sentence for, of 12 months under summary procedure and 14 years under solemn procedure. Can I, um, can I confirm if this would be uh, for coercive behaviour, a course of, um, without an abuse element, a physical abuse element? Yes, it would be for, um, it, the maximum penalty would be 14 years if it's prosecuted in the High Court, obviously, because it would need to be in the, the highest level of court. Um, and it could be for an offence that, where the course of conduct or the course of behaviour was entirely, um, there was no physical element to it. Clearly, it would be for the court to determine um, what we have in mind there in terms of setting the maximum penalty at 14 years, which is which, which is an increase on what we consulted upon, which was 10 years, and there was a number of views. Some suggesting it was about right, some suggesting it perhaps should be lowered, and quite a few suggesting it should be increased. But what we have in mind there is a course of conduct that might have gone on for years in a relationship it might include physical abuse, it might include psychological abuse, a mix of the two, where in effect someone has been living in that situation for year upon year upon year. And by setting the maximum penalty at 14 years, we want to ensure the court has the sufficient power to sentence appropriately. So that's why we've determined 14 years. So it's obviously reserved for the most serious offences. Um, but in answer to your question, it could include an offence where the course of conduct is entirely psychologically abuse. Although I would add that it's sometimes quite difficult to distinguish between what is physical abuse and psychological abuse. There's obviously quite a lot of overlap on occasion as well. Thank you, Stuart. Stevenson, supplementary. Uh, just a tiny wee point. Um, if it does not start as a solemn case, but it becomes clear that uh, the sentence of one year is not going to be sufficient as the facts have emerged. I take it sentencing can be referred upwards. 
Not, not in the scenario you've suggested, because the summary courts obviously sits without a jury, so you cannot take a case. So it's only if it starts in the sheriff's solemn court. So that's they have a maximum penalty of five years as their jurisdictional limit. So a case that starts in front of a jury in a sheriff court, and then the person is convicted, and the sheriff considers they need enhanced sentencing, they can remit it up to the high court. But you can't take a case from the summary court. If it begins in the summary court, that's where it ends. So this is substantial. Uh, obligation on the prosecutors to make sure that it goes in at the right level. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Liam? Following up on, on, on that, I mean, I think you've explained well the rationale for why you've got to where you've got to in terms of the 14-year uh, the, the maximum. Um, without appearing to draw too many simplistic parallels with the, the serious crime act 2015, um, I've been told that the, uh, the, the maximum custodial sentence there is five years. Now, that seems quite a, a significant discrepancy. Is, is that because the Serious Crime Act isn't picking up that, that, that kind of pattern of behaviour over um, multiple years? Or Obviously, I wouldn't want to speak for why it's been set at five years mm. down south, but their offence, um, and Patrick will keep me right here, is only coercive control, so it doesn't include physical elements. So therefore, our offence, the example I gave, in answer to the question was that it could be an entirely a course of conduct that's entirely psych psychological abuse or psychological harm but actually you know a far, perhaps a, a more realistic example might be a mix of the two where you've got very serious perhaps violent abuse and also psychological abuse all wrapped up together in one course of conduct and we just think we came to the view that five years would be insufficient and indeed following the consultation where we consulted on 10 that's why we determined to, to it, for the bill introduction to increase it to 14. If it were, it were psychological abuse and, and, and I'd take the point you're making about the, the, the way in which those can conflate yeah. that it's not beyond the realms that that could still find itself up around the maximum um, uh, on the basis of, of the, the, the specific circumstances? Well, obviously for a court in any given case, but we want to ensure the court has what we would consider to be the, the appropriate power to sentence, and that's, mm. that's where 14 years has come from. Okay. I think that concludes our questioning, so I thank the, the Bill team for providing evidence which has helped the committee to um, help to inform the committee and for it to understand the bill. We now move into private session. The next committee meeting will be on Tuesday 16th of May. Suspend briefly to allow the, allow the public gallery to clear.